Welcome to the Fermented Homestead. If you're new here, my name is Anna, and on this channel, I'm sharing our journey of learning how to turn our home into a homestead. Today, I'm doing a comparison of cauliflower. We're gonna do it many different ways, but we're gonna basically do it pickled versus fermented. And we're gonna see kind of comparing the process of both of them, as well as the end result and the flavor of them. We're only gonna be doing the pickled version one way and that's because it's a larger batch and it's it's canned and it's just a different process with that one. And then with the fermented ones, we're gonna be doing it probably three different ways. And I'm gonna be doing it today. I ended, I ended up actually getting another mason top set because I just didn't have enough of the mason tops. I could only ferment four different jars at the same time. And I that's just not enough for me. So I just ended up getting a whole new set. I haven't actually even opened this yet, so I'm pretty stoked about it. Uh, we're gonna be doing this three different ways, at least for now. I might throw in a fourth, but we'll see. So what my plan is, we're gonna do just a basic salt cauliflower ferment, kind of like the base, just cauliflower. See if I like that. And then we're also gonna do a dill one, so it's gonna be kind of like, almost like a dill pickle type. And then we're gonna be doing a spicy one. I'm thinking about doing a curry one, but we'll see how that one goes. I haven't decided just yet. So let's get cracking on this. It shouldn't take too terribly long. So what we're gonna do, okay. So I know that when I say basic, it always includes garlic. So each one of these, this is all I have for garlic. I don't have any more garlic. So we're just gonna split this amongst all four jars because each of the four jars, which apparently I've decided to do curry because that four jar just kind of appeared. We're gonna split this among the four jars. And I'm gonna I'm gonna try spices. I don't typically do a lot of spices in my fermenting because I just have a hard time keeping them down. So I'm gonna try and just keep the spices at the bottom. I'm gonna make sure that I'm extra vigilant with it. And then also I do have the pickle pipe, so that should help with any keep out any oxygen and should help limit any kind of mold that could form on it. So two cloves for each jar. So I did this kind of a lazy way, or the smart way, however you want to look at it. And I just got, I went to Costco and got a bunch of uh, cauliflower. So what we're gonna do, this first one, I'm not gonna add anything else to it other than cauliflower. The second one, we're gonna add some dill seed to it. Dill here. I'm gonna do one teaspoon. I don't really, I don't really know how much to use, but we're gonna go with a teaspoon of dill and then also like a half of a teaspoon of mustard seeds. So that's it for that one. And then this one is gonna be the spicy one. This one we're gonna add red chili flakes. Just go with a teaspoon. And then also with ground Cameroon pepper. And this stuff, yeah, why not? And this stuff is pretty darn spicy. That should, that should give us a pretty fair amount. And then for this one, we're gonna do more of a, cur more of a, a, like a curry Indian style. And so we're gonna add a teaspoon of turmeric. A half a teaspoon of curry. And then just for a good measure, a couple of healthy pinches of ginger. Okay, so now we're just gonna go ahead and pour in, so you can see, uh, we're gonna pour in the uh, cauliflower and I'm gonna kind of just cut it up into nice little bite-sized pieces. I wanna make sure that I can fit as much in the jar as I can and cutting it up smaller should achieve that. And when we're fermenting, we're not gonna do it as as we would with with canning. With canning, you wanna have like a much smaller headspace. And with this, you want about an inch and a half of headspace. You wanna make sure that you're giving yourself enough room for, for the weight to go on top, as well as for the water that's inside as the fermentation is taking place, it's gonna expand and contract. And if you don't leave enough room in there, you're gonna have a really big mess on your hands and all the water is just gonna go everywhere and it's just no fun. So now that we have our jars all filled, 
we're gonna go ahead and top this off with our brine. We're using the same brine for all of them and it's roughly a 2% salt solution. And it is, I put in there, I put two quarts of water and four tablespoons, really five tablespoons. So I guess it's more like a 3%-ish kind of brine. So I put like five tablespoons of salt in the brine, let it just warm up uh, enough to melt the salt. It's not hot, it's not anything that's gonna kill the bacteria on here. Anything over, I think it's 80 something degrees, I could be wrong on that, but anything anything too high will kill the bacteria in here and it will make it very difficult, if not impossible, to ferment. If there's not enough bacteria in here to begin the process of fermentation, then it's very likely that it will uh, mold before it will ferment. The brine that I had warmed up on the stove, I got a little bit too warm, as I always do. So we let it cool off and now we're ready to go ahead and just pour it over all of the veggies. Hopefully we made enough. So now all we're gonna do is we're just gonna add our weights on top here. Push it down just a little bit. You just wanna make sure that all the food inside of there is uh, submerged underneath the brine. That's the most important part about this whole thing. The food has to be underneath the brine. If any of the food is exposed to the air, if it's floating on top or anything like that, that is gonna be where the mold is gonna land and that's where it's gonna to start to form. If there's nothing on top, there's nothing for the mold to hold onto. If there's no food on the top, there's nothing for the mold to hold onto, so it's not gonna form. Or certainly at the very least, it's gonna be very difficult for it to form. Not very likely. Okay. All right, so we're just gonna push all these down. And then we're gonna cover it with our pickle pipes. Cover it with the rings. So if you are just curious about fermentation and you're just kind of wondering, you know, what it is and how, how it is and uh, kind of what's involved with it. And if you're coming from canning, then it should be really easy for you to get started. You, if you have canning jars, rings, lids, you don't actually need to buy anything. These things are just kind of nice to have. And they're just, especially for somebody who ferments as much as I do, it's really nice to have it. I don't have to tend to like, you know, 10 different jars at the same time. All I have to do is just check them periodically to make sure that, that everything is going well. And that's about all there is to it. So, and if they're in these jars, the odds of anything really happening, if they're in the jars with the lids, there's the odds of anything happening to these are pretty darn slim. I have, I think I've had maybe two things ever go bad. One was a jalapeno that I was fermenting and that one went bad, but that was only because of the fermenting conditions. It had nothing to do with the tops. I had just moved and I hadn't been paying attention to it whatsoever. And I just put it in the living room right next to the fireplace. It was too hot and I went way too long without me paying any attention to it. If I hadn't paid any mind to it, that never would have happened. So I can't really put that on the, the, these here. So anything short of user error, there is a really slim chance that anything would mold or anything would happen with these. So we're gonna test this every day until we find out how long it takes for this ferment to get under a 4.0 pH. So we kind of have a gauge as to how long. And that number is gonna be very different depending on what you're actually fermenting. The higher the sugar content, the quicker it will ferment. More often than not, if you add a starter culture into it, it will also cause it to go under 4.0 pH quicker. So now that we are all finished with the fermenting part of this, that's all there is really to involved with fermenting. It's literally just throw ingredients in the jar, cover it with a brine, make sure it stays under the water. You know, use one of these. You can use a, an airlock lid. You can use a balloon if you want to. There's all different sorts of things that you can use. Just very basic all the way to from totally basic, like you could use a rock for a weight if you want to. I did that for a long time before I got the mason jars. I just literally picked a rock out of my yard that fit in there. And then I put it, ran it through the dishwasher. I boiled it, I made sure it was super sanitized. And then I used it as my weight. And then not like, like antibacterial, like spray sanitized, but you know, just, you know, the nap, you don't want to use any of that. You don't want any of that to come near this. Um, that's another thing to note. You don't want to clean your, your stuff that you're fermenting with antibacterial soap because you want the bacteria and all of the antibacterial stuff will leave residues on your stuff. I don't like to, to chemically sanitize anything that I use. I just like to use heat or I like to use, you know, just basic soap, water and time washing is 
plenty. Don't use antibacterial soaps with any of your fermentation products at all, like ever. Just don't do it. It'll leave residue and it'll cause a lot of problems for you. But anyway, so now we're going to go ahead and we are going to move on to the pickled can version of the pickled cauliflower. And so we're going to get all that set up and then I'm going to bring you back and show you that process. Oh, another tip. When you're fermenting, you always want to put your fermentation vessels inside of something that can catch any overflow. Anything that you can find, I usually find that the 13 by 9 baking dishes work wonderfully and they have a nice little handle and they're made to hold a fair amount of weight. So it works out pretty well. Okay, so now we are ready and all set up to get the cauliflower pickling and canning. So we have all of our jars, they've been sanitized because they have a very short cook time. So I just felt more comfortable actually sanitizing the jars. So then what we have is all of our cauliflower over here, uh, same cauliflower from Costco. So the recipe that I'm using is one I'm kind of adapting from Living Traditions Homestead. She recently did one on pickled cauliflower, pickled spicy cauliflower. I don't have all the ingredients that she had, so I'm just gonna go ahead and kind of tweak it and make it a bit more of my own. In her recipe, she used a half of a teaspoon of uh, black peppercorns, a half of a teaspoon of mustard seed, and she used a whole jalapeno. I don't have jalapenos right now. I'm not going to the store. So we're going to substitute that, but we're going to get the rest of this stuff going and a half of a teaspoon of peppercorns in each jar. I'm just going to put it at the bottom. And then a half a teaspoon of mustard seed. And then uh, what she used in, the, in her recipe was fresh garlic. I don't have fresh garlic. I just have this stuff that we got from Costco. And I read the ingredients label. All that's in here is garlic, water, and citric acid. So there's nothing that should interfere with the canning process. There's nothing that should make it take more time or take a different procedure. Okay, and then so according to the label here, a half of a teaspoon is equal to one garlic clove. So we're gonna do a heaping teaspoon because I like garlic. And we're just gonna put it in the bottom of every jar. And we have some dehydrated Thai red peppers and I'm gonna use this in here. I'm gonna snap each one. And I don't mind the seeds whatsoever. I really enjoy heat. I enjoy canned heat, fermented heat, any kind of heat that's right at my alley. So I think I'm gonna put like two maybe in each one. So now that we have the chilies in there, I'm really, I'm tempted to add like some red pepper flakes or something like that to it, but I've never made this recipe and I've never canned any sort of heat in a pickled form. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna reserve it for next time. And I'm just gonna leave it at that. Hopefully that will be spicy enough and it'll give enough flavor that I'm gonna enjoy it. Okay, so next what we're gonna do is we're just gonna, just gonna pack the jars. That's all there is left. Uh, I realized that I spoke a little bit too soon. While we are filling the jars, we should probably be heating up our brine. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna use the recipe that she used in her video, and that is uh, four cups of apple cider vinegar, four cups of white distilled vinegar, and then eight cups of water. She added a half of a cup of salt to hers, and she said the recipe that she was using called for a, a whole cup. I'm gonna go in the middle and I'm gonna put about three quarters of a cup because I really do enjoy salt. And so we're just gonna put this on the burner and bring it up to a boil. So now that we're bringing the, that up to a boil, we're gonna go ahead and just fill our jars with cauliflower. The larger ones, we're gonna go ahead and cut it in half just to make sure that we can at least try and get this as filled as possible. So now we're gonna go ahead and just pour this brine in here. Maybe not, it's vinegary. So uh, now we're gonna go ahead and pour this uh, brine over the pickles. So 
So the next step that we're gonna do is we're gonna debubble the cauliflower. And that's just sticking our little debubbler. You can use, if you have a debubbler, use that. If you don't, you can use like a chopstick, you can use like a wooden spoon. You just don't wanna use anything metal because you can scrape the sides of your jar and possibly crack it. So you wanna avoid that. But basically we're just sticking this inside of here to get rid of any of the um, any of the air pockets that might be trapped inside there to release it so that it will have the proper amount of um, headspace in the end. So now we're just gonna go ahead and top these off to um, half an inch headspace. When you're filling this up to a half an inch of headspace, there's a couple different ways that you can measure it. You can use a debubbler. If you don't have one, the one that has the little stepping thing on it and the, you're gonna use the middle one, so the half an inch one. And then another way that you can tell, I measured it earlier just to make sure that I was giving you correct information. And here on the jar, you have these rings that are on here. You have the bottom ring. This bottom of this ring is one inch. And then if you bring it, you know, to where the, the threads meet, the bottom of this thread is a half an inch and the bottom of this thread is a quarter of an inch. So that's a pretty quick way to be able to tell the proper headspace. And you want to make sure that you're getting the proper headspace because of the expansion and contraction of all of the, the air and just, you know, everything in there. You want to have the proper headspace so that it can create the proper vacuum. I'm not explaining it very well, but it is important. So just whatever recipe you're following should say in the recipe what your, your headspace should be. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna put lids on these. And we're gonna make sure we're using fresh, clean, new lids for this process. So let me grab some. So before you actually put the lid on here, you wanna make sure that it's free of any kind of stickiness, any particles, any oil, any grease, you know, anything. You know, obviously we're not gonna have oil or grease on this recipe, but other recipes you will. So you wanna take a towel. Sometimes you can use just a, a dry towel. Sometimes you can use a wet towel. Sometimes you should use vinegar, you know, and so I just use vinegar every time just because I don't want to worry or wonder which one should be which. I just always use the safe route with the vinegar. So we're just wiping the rim. In this particular recipe, there's no sugar, there's no oil or anything like that. So we're pretty much just wiping off any remnants, any any particles, any food particles, because if you leave food particles on the rim, it will interfere with the seal. These, uh, these uh, canning lids, they have this orange rim around it, and that's like a, a kind of a heat activated glue kind of, that will seal on the jar. And if you have anything obstructing it or anything in the way, then, um, then it can interfere with the actual sealing process and you're gonna get not a seal that will last in your pantry. So uh, just wipe it off and you're good to go. Okay, so we put the lid on there and then we tighten it, fingertip tight, as tight as you can get it with these three fingers here with a reasonable amount of strength. You don't wanna break it on there, but you just kind of do that for each one. In case you couldn't tell, I've been doing a lot of canning today and a lot of fermenting and just a lot of stuff. So into the canner it goes. Onto my counter it goes. I have it warmed up too much. So I turned off the heat on that. I have found for, through personal experience because I have done it before. If you have the water sitting on there, you wanna keep it relatively coolish. I mean, not cool, but you don't want it to be boiling. You don't want it to be simmering and like overheated because it'll crack your jars. I've done it. So that one, we're gonna just wait a little while and uh, let it cool off. Uh, not a while, we're just gonna wait a little bit. It doesn't take too long to cool it down. Uh, the temperature that I have heard is 180 degrees. So in this case, I'm probably gonna temp it just to make sure, cause I don't wanna crack any of these um, and waste all of our hard work. 
Okay, so we're gonna let that water cool off just a little bit. I'll bring you back in a couple minutes when we're ready to load it into the cannon. The water has cooled off, and so now we're gonna go ahead and load this up. Yes, I'm using a water bath canner, or a, pardon me, a pressure canner, but I'm just using it as a water bath canner. Okay, so even after dumping out all of that water, this thing is still too full. So we're gonna go ahead and I'm going to empty off some more water. We're gonna run this, we're gonna let it come to a boil. But once it's boiling, we're gonna let it boil for 15, 10 minutes, she said, 10 minutes. And then when the 10 minutes is over, we're gonna turn the heat off and let it set with the lid off for five minutes. Okay, so all of our times are up. We have canned this for 10 minutes. We actually did 15, uh, just for safe measure. And then now, we turn it off, let it set for five minutes with the lid off. And so now we're just gonna pull this stuff out of the can. So these are all done processing. And so now what we need to do is we need to let it sit on the counter for 24 hours, totally undisturbed, just leave them alone. So, and then after 24 hours, we're gonna remove the rings. We're gonna wash them down throw them in the pantry and then let them kind of marinate and just kind of get all of their goodness all together while the cauliflower, the fermenting cauliflower is fermenting. And then when all of them are done, we're gonna go ahead and give them a taste test. Because from what I understand with these, you don't want to taste them right away because the, the vinegar, the pickling process would not have taken place yet. So you want to let it, after you can it, this is something you have to wait before you actually try it. It's been about a week. I think it's been a week exactly since we set our cauliflower to ferment. And I've been testing it almost every single night. And I missed last night, I just had a bunch of stuff that was going on and I just didn't have the ability to actually test them. So we're gonna test it again tonight. It's not night, it's day. We're gonna test it today. Okay, so. In there for a few seconds. Okay. I'm pretty, it's, uh, I'd say it's like 4.2. It's so close, it's annoying. So my thinking is that I'm gonna test the other ones. I'm gonna see if they're all taking kind of this long to actually ferment. Yeah. What is up with the cauliflower? I did a sauerkraut and it took like three days without a starter. I'm not sure what is happening here. This is a curried one. No, oh, what in the world? Maybe I should have added a starter. It smells like it's fermenting. I don't understand. I wonder if my strips could be wrong. But I just tested my uh, cabbage last week and they were fine. So, I mean, I don't know. It smells fermented. So we're just gonna go ahead and throw this back into our sto uh, ferment storage and we're just gonna let it keep going until it gets under the 4.0 pH. And I'll keep bringing you guys along and let you know, well, I'm probably not gonna show you every single day. I'm just gonna test it every day. And then I'll bring you back and show you when it actually gets under the pH, how long it actually took. This is definitely not normal. It normally takes, you know, three to five days. So I'm not entirely sure what's happening with this. I don't think I use too much salt. You know, my room is not too cold. And so I'm not entirely sure what's happening with the cauliflower. Maybe it's just the cauliflower itself. Maybe since it was, I bet it's probably actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it's probably because I used packaged stuff and I probably should have added a starter culture to this. So I have some green beans left over. So let's go ahead and test this. Make sure we got a good pH. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's way down low, can you see? So these strips definitely work. We're at like 3.2. So these strips work. So the way that we're gonna go ahead and fix this, okay. I don't typically make a habit a whole lot of fermenting with the prepackaged stuff. So it, ha it should have occurred to me sooner, but it didn't that I, since I used the prepackaged stuff, it probably didn't have the, quite the level of bacteria on the actual vegetable itself to be able to start itself and to start fermenting. So we're gonna resolve that really quick here. And we're gonna add in a couple of tablespoons into each one out of my green bean ferment. 
It's a starter culture. Uh, you can buy like the pr little packets of starter cultures and things like that, but all you need is just an, a pre-existing ferment. If you need to have an accelerant or a starter or something like that, all you need is a pre-existing one that has a brine to it. And so let me show you real quick how we're gonna fix this. So I have freshly clean hands. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the tops off of each one of these and we're gonna add in the ferment juice. Starter culture, whatever. And all right. if you're new to fermenting, you need to know that you do not want to use any metal. You can get away with stainless steel, but you want to avoid metal and for the most part as much as humanly possible when dealing with your ferments. And the reason for that is that it is, it's just going to break down and it's going to kind of leach the chemicals and stuff. Um, it's just, you're not supposed to. So for whatever reason, plastic is fine. So all we're gonna do is just scoop in here and grab a couple teaspoons, tablespoons, pardon me, a couple tablespoons. I'm just go with three. Okay, put it back on there. Close it back up. And we got one. And there's a clean plate, clean hands, clean everything. You wanna make sure that you're not going to be introducing any other bacteria that you don't want to have. The whole time that we've had these ferments in storage, it hasn't leaked even a drop into our pan. So, I mean, it's completely just non-active at all. So, uh, now that we have added the ferment to it, it should probably, hopefully, only take about two or three more days to actually get the bacteria and everything working inside of there. And so that's another, I guess, another aspect to fermentation is you can add the starter culture to it. Like I said, that will accelerate it and it will actually inoculate it with the proper bacteria that it needs to start breaking down and start fermenting. Starter culture is fine. It's still going to taste good, but I like to have it to where it is doesn't have any starter culture. It takes, I like the longer fermentation times. It just gives it a, sorry for the chickens in the background. I have chickens and they make noise. So um, I just like to use the regular wild fermentation. I don't like to add starter cultures to it because the slower fermentation, uh, each stage of the fermentation process, <laughs> I have a lot of roosters too. <laughs> so the slower fermentation process, it allows it to just develop a m different, more complex and kind of deeper flavors. It just, it makes it taste better basically. Uh, but these still taste great, I'm sure. And we'll find that out hopefully here in the next couple of days. It has been a few days since we last visited the cauliflower, the fermented cauliflower. I've been at work and it's just been kind of nuts. And so now I actually have an opportunity to go ahead and test these. And we're gonna go ahead and start off with the original one, the regular unflavored, nothing to it, cauliflower and we're going to see if adding the um, if adding the starter culture helped it to go to the correct piece. It did. Okay so that's the original one. Let's see if any of these other ones are any lower of a pH. Okay this is the spicy one. Is it? Yep this is the spicy one. Four point oh. So I'm not gonna waste any more pH strips. Uh, this has officially reached a the safe level of the pH. There's no mold growing on top. Let me check these other two just for mold. We're good. One more. Get open it. And good. There's nothing wrong with these. Ooh, this one actually does have one thing that I can show you here. My lighting's just terrible. I'm sorry. But there's like a white kind of a, a film on top of here and that's just the calm yeast and it's nothing to worry about these little speckles are neat i need to scoop them off but those are just uh cauliflower chunks there's no mold on here so th there will be if i don't get the chunks off though but you can see kind of there's like a film on top of here it's just a white film and like i said that's just calm yeast totally normal nothing wrong with it it usually just happens with ferments that are on the sweeter side but this one is not so now that we know that the fermenting fermentation process is definitely going, it took a little while. It's been like a week and a half. I started this last Saturday and now it's Thursday, or pardon me, last Sunday. And now it's Thursday, what's Sunday? 
no, I started this last Monday. Now it's Thursday, so it's been like a week and what, three days, something like that. Uh, so now it's finally gone. And I think cauliflower might just be one of those things that you need to add a, at least cauliflower, bagged cauliflower might be something that you just need to add a starter to and it will help the process along and then just kind of wait. So that's what we had going on here. Ooh, there's a fly. Um, so that's what we had going on here. And so now I'm just gonna put this back. It's not ready yet. I don't even care to try it just yet because it's just such a, it's just at 4.0. So I wanna let it go a little bit longer. I know it's not gonna be ready. So there's not really much point just keeping track of it. So the time has finally come and I think that the cauliflower is ready, at least for the first taste test. Hopefully it'll be ready, but let's find out. So we're gonna start out with just the very basic cauliflower. This one is just the salt and cauliflower and that's it. Okay. Smells good, smells fermented. We got a little bit of calm yeast on top. I'm gonna go ahead and just skim some of this off here. Nothing to be worried about. There we go. Okay, we're gonna get the weight out of here. Well, actually, I can just reach in here because this is the fancy new kind. Okay. Mm-hmm, okay. And I've never had this before, ever. I do, I like that. I definitely, I think it's done. Okay, so that one's good. Let's go with the curried one next, shall we? That is really good. Wow. That curry one is good. Wow, I like it. Okay, so we're on to, this is like the dill pickle one. Or, you know, the dill seasoning, whatever you want, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Hmm. Smells about like the curry one. Maybe it's just the smell of fermenting cauliflower. It just smells weird. This one has even less flavor than the plain one. That one so far is, I'll eat it, but it's certainly not my favorite. The curry one's the best so far. All right, now we have the spicy one. Okay. Mm. <laughs> it smells spicy. Okay. Got some heat to it. Mm. Okay. Here we go. Definitely needs a lot more heat. Maybe once we get down to the bottom of the jar, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a good amount of spice at the bottom. So maybe once we get down to the bottom, it'll have a little bit more heat to it. Okay, so here's our giant plate of fermenting stuff. So the ferments, those are all good. I would definitely say that the curry's my favorite. This one would be my favorite if it had more heat to it, but it doesn't, so it's not. And then the plain one, and then definitely the dill one is the last. Like it has almost no flavor to it. I'm not sure why. So, those are all wins though. I'll eat all of them just fine. No issues whatsoever. Okay, so now we're gonna try the actual pickled cauliflower. I've never tried this before, ever. And we canned this, so. Now it got a nice sound to it. Smells like pickles, kinda. Okay. It's a little bit too sweet for me. It doesn't have too much salt. It just doesn't really taste like salt at all. I think I would definitely, ugh, it's got like sugar in it. So I think I would definitely, if I were to make this again, I would definitely crank the heat. It needs a lot more heat in it than it has. So hopefully the next time, if I'm gonna do this again, I will have some actual jalapenos that I can throw in there so I can actually do the recipe some justice, but it just has too much sugar. It tastes really sweet. 
I don't remember how much sugar I put in this, but it just, it, it tastes sweet. It, it tastes like a spicy sweet pickle, but not quite, I don't like sweet pickles. At least I haven't found one that I like. I'm not saying I'll never like one, but I just generally, I prefer dill pickles. But this one, I like it. I do. I'm not saying I don't, but this one is definitely not crunchy. <laughs> not crunchy at all. These ones are still almost, almost as crunchy as they were um, in the fridge, but they have lost a little bit of their crunch, which is fine by me. They're still very crunchy. And this is, while it's not mushy, it's certainly not crunchy. It still retains its texture, not its texture. It's kind of like a almost cooked through cauliflower. It's not mushy, but it's certainly not crunchy at all. Totally not crunchy. So I definitely, in my opinion, probably because I just enjoy fermented foods so much, hence, you know, fermented homestead, I, I would definitely pick, pick fermented. All of these fermented ones, okay, maybe not the dill. I'd probably pick this one over the dill, but for the most part, definitely fermented over pickled. I like, I like it much better. So I, I hope that, that you kind of got a little bit of an understanding and uh, a bit of a comparison of the fermented versus, fermented versus pickled, kind of what some of the differences are uh, both in end product as well as processes. And while there, there's a lot of different health benefits to fermented versus pickled, and fermented, in my humble opinion, has a lot more health benefits to it. It has a lot more internal health benefits to it. Uh, however, the pickled one, it also has its own benefits to it. V vinegar, especially depending on what type of vinegar you use, it has different health benefits to it. I, I haven't done a tremendous amount of research into the health benefits of vinegars, but I know that they are very, very beneficial for you. And I'm not sure how much that is diminished when it comes to canning it. So I think probably the next time that we do a fermented vers it versus pickled comparison, I think we're gonna do refrigerator pickles just so that we can have a true actual comparison because I think that that it lost a little something in the canning not that there's anything wrong with canning because it also brings its own benefits of being very shelf stable for a really long time so that is definitely one of the benefits to uh, doing uh, pit like pickling canning pickling so I mean that is one of the huge benefits of it these ones they have to go in the fridge they cannot be stable at room temperature I mean, they can, but they'll continue to ferment and ferment and ferment and likely eventually start to mold and just be funky. So this has a win for long-term food preservation. It has a totally different flavor to it and it cooks in the process. This stuff, just better flavor. I think it has a lot more health benefits to it. And this is much simpler as well. Like it's literally like you just, you saw everything that I did with it. You just throw it in a jar cover it with brine and put it away for a couple week or two, or you could even do longer. Really, I could let this, definitely let this go longer, but I'm not going to. So I hope you enjoyed coming along with me and sharing a lot of the differences between the fermented versus pickled cauliflower. If you enjoyed this video and kind of the idea of it, of the fermented versus pickled, or if you have any other ideas that you would like me to try out, a bunch of different verses, or just any kind of fermented thing that you think would be interesting for me to try, go ahead and leave it in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from you. And if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and we'll see you next time. Bye.